This program is brought to you by Emory University. I'm going to introduce our speakers today. We are very excited to have Josh Norris and Steven Schwartz here as a special unexpected guest. And thank you for coming to talk to us today about EP. DST, EPSDT. Um, Josh Norris is the Director of Legal Advocacy for the Georgia Advocacy Office. He has been there since 2004 and he is incredibly busy these days with several aspects of litigation. One is a suit um, against the Department of Community Health, active litigation in federal court on this issue and he will bring us up to speed on what's going on with that and what federal law requires. He has also been involved with the Department of Justice in the investigation into what's happening with um, Georgia Mental Health Hospitals, and he's also been working to resolve those issues and led a group to oppose the original settlement in that suit and to lead to a better collaboration and a way to address those issues. He has worked on a variety of legislative and policy issues that impact people with disabilities and mental illnesses, including the development of Georgia's Olmstead Plan and the Advanced Directive for Health Care Act, as well as voting and election issues. So we have basically one of the state's premier experts on this issue here with us today. And he brought with us the executive director of the Center for Public Representation, Stephen Schwartz, who has practiced disability and civil rights law for many years. Um, he has extensive experience litigating class action suits to enforce the rights of people with disabilities and mental health needs, and particularly focused on the reform and development of community services systems for persons with disabilities. Um, he is currently working on class action cases in Arizona, Florida, New Mexico, and Massachusetts. And he'll be talking to us about the impact of one of those cases in Massachusetts on children with disabilities and psychiatric issues. So he, um, he's been on the faculty of Harvard and Western New England law schools, and he is one of the, as I said, the attorneys, well, no, he's the executive director of the Center for Public Representation, and he has um, provided extensive support to attorneys in Massachusetts and nationally on these issues. So thank you and welcome. There, okay. Thank you. Um, hi, Josh Norris. Good to see everybody this afternoon. Um, yeah, there's food in the afternoon, not a good sign. <laughs> we'll work around it. I'll, I'll keep this invigorating. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about my organization and what we do, um, my own sort of introduction to EPSDT, how I sort of came to this. And then what I've found out in the last couple of years that I've been uh, working with this. And then um, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen, who's going to um, provide you with um, just an amazing perspective on a huge case, which, uh, you know, is going to have, it is having and should have uh, ramifications, positive ramifications for uh, kids throughout the country. So. First thing, what is the Georgia Advocacy Office? We are the Designated Protection and Advocacy System. Uh, we're a private nonprofit, but we are mandated by federal law to protect and advocate on behalf of people with disabilities. Um, we receive federal funding. Um, there are basically seven pieces of legislation uh, that we do our work through. Um, first order of business is to protect people from abuse, neglect, and death. Um, and to also redress discrimination and advocate for legal rights people. Um, we have an investigatory power. We spend a lot of time in all kinds of facilities, uh, state hospitals, juvenile facilities, nursing facilities, anywhere where people are locked away or confined in one way or another. Um, we have access to them. Um, and we can investigate incidents of abuse and neglect in those places uh, when we get information about them. Um, we also provide information or referral, and we do uh, provide administrative, legal, and other appropriate uh, remedies. Um, basically, we can file lawsuits. Um, like I said, we have access authority, and, and interestingly enough, I was actually in court today on an access issue, because we're arguing with the state about access to one of the state hospitals. Um, so I'm going to try and get my head in the right place. Um, but we're entitled to unaccompanied access. 
uh, basically to, pe to wherever people are being served. That's the concept. Um, where they're being served, we, sh we are allowed to go and see what's going on. Um, these are the federal statutory authorities um, that give us this access power. Now, using Medicaid to get children what they need. Um, that's how I think of this. Um, a lot of the work that we do at GAO, uh, oftentimes <coughs> with kids, is someone will call. It'll be a crisis because the um, child is at risk of being institutionalized or um, they've got some extreme health care needs that aren't being met and uh, the kid will be hospitalized. Um, it's always some sort of crisis. And <clears throat> typically with these kids, what you find is that they're all Medicaid eligible. And Medicaid plays a huge part in the types of care and services that the, these kids get or don't get, as the case may be. And when you start looking into this, particularly their rights under Medicaid, you find this stunning mandate. I mean, it really is stunning. And I think that actually the judge in the Rosie D case uh, references it in the first two pages of his opinion. He basically says it's an unprecedented mandate that every Medicaid eligible child in the United States under the age of 21 should be getting all the health care services that they need. That's it. That's the basic concept. I mean, that's, that's what's in the statute. Um, now, obviously, there's a lot more detail to that, but that's, that's essentially the concept going forward. And I think when you talk to people who work with kids, you quickly discover that that's not actually happening for most of the, the kids that they know that are Medicaid eligible. And so what I want to do today is just talk uh, a little bit about EPSDT and, and sort of what the parameters are, what is it, um, and then at the end uh, talk a little bit about how you could do some practical things to try and access it for kids on whose behalf you're working. Um, and then, you know, in the q and I, I figured we can talk about any sort of uh, litigation or other things that are going on in the state um, in relationship either to what Stephen's done with Rosie D, what we're doing with, on behalf of um, some medically fragile kids uh, around nursing services. Um, so, but, and the other thing is, please interrupt me. I, I, I'm one of those speakers, I do not mind being interrupted. I actually like it if the conversation just kind of meanders its own way. Um, we end up getting it all covered. Okay, so the Medicaid Act. Um, you're going to find it at 42 U.S.C. 1396. Um, essentially, it's a federal-state partnership uh, to provide insurance to various classes of people. Um, and this has been around since 1965. Um, it specifies some basic requirements that states must meet, um, as well as options. That's, that's a... And that'll, uh, we're going to make a distinction. The options, optional services and things, that really applies to adults. We're going to get to how EPSDT is mandatory. Um, so there are minimum standards regarding eligibility, scope of services, protections for people who uh, are beneficiaries in that system. Um, basically, if the state chooses to participate, once you're in, you are bound by the rules. Okay? Um, Eligibility, this is not my area of expertise. If you have questions about that, I know people who know the answers to those questions. I will tell you, though, that uh, basically it's children whose family income is below the federal poverty level, children in foster care, Medicaid eligible, uh, el children eligible for SSI, um, if a child resides in an institution for more than 30 days, uh, which is actually related to the Katie Beckett issue. Katie Beckett, everybody talks about that as a waiver what it is, it's, it's not a waiver um, in the traditional sense of uh, a, a um, group of services or, uh, for people. It's a waiver in the sense that um, it essentially waives the requirement um, around parental income so that essentially uh, families, middle class families with kids with very, very significant needs um, meeting institutional level of care can get access to Medicaid so that their needs can be met through Medicaid. All right, EPSDT, yes? SSI supplemental security income? Yeah, it's Social Security. Yep. He asked what SSI was for those on camera. Um, 
Early and periodic screening, diagnosis, and treatment. I always find it fascinating just to sort of read that and think about what it's telling you. It's saying early and periodic screening. Okay, we should be, uh, you know, early on in a child's life and periodically thereafter screening them. And then diagnosis and treatment. Okay, so there's a connection there between the screening and ultimately ending up with treatment. It's found at 42 USC 1396DR. It was added initially to the Medicaid program in 1967. And the states were given a, a fair amount of um, leeway about how they wanted to structure their EPSDT program, how they wanted to structure services for kids. Okay? Um, and Congress was not too happy with how that turned out because 20 years later, they still found that a bunch of kids across the United States who are Medicaid eligible were still not having their needs met. Um, and so in 1989, they, uh, Congress significantly amended the Medicaid Act um, and created a whole new series of, of requirements in EPSDT that effectively took away a lot of the state's discretion. Um, and one of the things it did is it made a lot of the services mandatory. Um, so what is the EPSDT? It's basically a mandatory Medicaid program requiring states to provide comprehensive, preventive, acute, and chronic care services to children and youth under 21 who are eligible for Medicaid. Um, it emphasizes the early discovery of illness through medical, dental, vision, and hearing screenings, and then tying the needs identified in those screenings, the conditions, the illnesses, to actual treatment. Um, medical screens. This is one of the first basic requirements. Um, these are the components. Health and developmental assessment, unclothed physical exam, immunizations, lab tests, health education and anticipatory guidance. Um, you know, the, and this, these are the things obviously, unclothed physical exam, lab tests. I mean, you're going to your doctor's office to do these things. Yes. I had a question regarding the previous slide where the mandatory medical program requiring yep. states to provide conference. Is that regardless of whether they actually have Medicaid or not, just as long as they're eligible? Yeah, well, you have to, I mean, it, when I say eligible, there are those categories that um, children are eligible for. Now, whether or not they technically are <laughs> on the Medicaid rolls, so to speak, and have a Medicaid number, sometimes that's one of the first orders of business is to get them in to Medicaid because you know that they should be eligible. Um, and then once they're in, then it's mandatory, okay? The, the real issue, and this is, this is what I was talking about with Katie Beckett. Katie Beckett is just a, a sort of a portal that you have to get through. It's the eligibility portal. Once you're through and you get to the other side, you then have the full package of Medicaid services. You should. I mean, that's, that's the, the concept. Does that answer your question? have a follow-up question with regards to the eligibility within the context of the foster care system and uh, children who move from foster care to you know um, guardianship or something of that nature can you tell me how if, if they become eligible because they're in the foster care system is there some provision that provides that children who have been in foster care foster care will maintain their eligibility regardless of the income of the families that they end up with? That, well, and like I said, I mean, that's a great question. I would be happy to afterwards sit and talk about that and then figure out who to get you in touch with. That eligibility is not my, my strong suit, and I would, I, in fairness to everybody here and the folks on, on camera, I would not want to try and answer that question now because um, it, it kind of goes beyond sort of what, I, what we're trying to talk about. Um, but I'm happy to talk with you afterwards. Um, okay, medical screens. Vision, hearing, and dental screening. Uh, vision screening, including eyeglasses, the provision of eyeglasses. You would think that this would be um, something automatic, but, you know, same thing with hearing. Hearing aids, dental, including the relief of pain, restoration of teeth, and maintenance of dental health. Um, okay. So, we're talking about screening. There are types of screens. There's your initial screen at birth when you, whenever you become eligible for Medicaid. Um, 
periodic screens. These are going to be sort of, you know, your well baby, you know, regular checkups. Anybody who has kids, you know, they put you on this sort of regimen of you got to get into the doctor periodically, okay? Well, that's driven by uh, sort of these bodies of, of experts, both physicians and dentists, who've come up with uh, what they call periodicity schedules. Um, and that's what drives the periodic screens. Um, these would be just regular checkups. And then you have probably, mo and most importantly, interperiodic screens, okay? Um, these are going to be visits that can happen at any time that you, you go to see your doctor for whatever reason. So that if during that time you're seeing your doctor, they discover something, whether they need to have you tested or they need to prescribe a particular type of treatment, um, this would qualify as a screen under EPSDT. So, um, as I was saying, any contact with a healthcare professional is a potential screen that can trigger diagnosis and treatment. Okay? Um, for these screens, the state can't require prior authorization. Okay? You should be able to just get them um, as a Medicaid eligible child. Go see your doctor. Um, important features of this sort of screening mechanism, the idea of getting early and periodic screening, there should be appointment and transportation assistance provided. This is actually a requirement of our Medicaid agency. Okay? Um, again, no prior authorization. Uh, any encounter with a physician is an interperiodic screen. And I apologize for any uh, redundancy here. I was trying to do this at 5 o'clock this morning before my hearing. Um, treatment under EPSDT. Okay, now this is where sort of the rubber hits the road. If a screener finds a service to be necessary to correct or ameliorate, and I'm going to harp on those words again and again because they are the key words, to correct or ameliorate a child's condition or illness, the state must cover it so long as it is within the categories of services listed at 42 30, USC 1396A. 1396DA is a long list of services um, and encompasses, as one court has described, hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of things. Um, you know, and I, I, I haven't bothered to, to see how many or how much, but it, it seems like most of the health care that you and I are all aware of. Um, so the state must arrange directly or through referral for treatment found to be necessary as a result of a screen. They actually have an obligation to do this. Um, you know, and I, I'm not quite sure that actually happens in Georgia that much. Um, so there are, like I was saying, in 1396DA, there are 28 broad categories or classes of medical assistance, hundreds of subclasses of services and treatments. The key, and I'm going to, there's a slide about this later, really is to connect up the, ki the thing, the service, the treatment that your treating physician is thinking about prescribing with one of these categories, okay? Um, because if, it, if you could fit it into a category, it's covered. Um, all classes, because one of the things about these 28 classes of medical assistance, if you were talking about adults, there are certain mandatory classes and then there are a whole bunch of optional classes of services. The state develops what's called a state Medicaid plan. In that Medicaid plan, they tell you, they tell the federal government and Medicaid beneficiaries, the things that are optional that they have decided to cover and the way in which they're going to cover them. So it gives them actually a lot of flexibility and leeway relative to their adult population. With kids, however, um, all, the ca all the classes of services are mandatory. They don't have options, okay? So there's a bunch of them, and I think that's most everything that's listed actually in 1396DA. Um, the, and I, the one we're doing, I've got a case going right now on private duty nursing services. Um, Steve's case, uh, I know, dealt with a variety of things, but rehabilitative services, and I'm going to touch on that category itself. I'm actually going to show you what it says, because it's, it's kind of stunning what it says, I think, when you actually read the language and think about it for a minute. Um, but, you know, I mean, as you can see, there's just a lot here. 
So, rehabilitative services, defined as other diagnostic, screening, preventive, and rehabilitative services, including any medical or remedial services provided in a facility, home, or other setting recommended by a physician or other licensed practitioner of the healing arts within the scope of their practice under state law, so anybody under state law who's allowed to prescribe, uh, for the maximum reduction of physical or mental disability and the restoration of the individual to the best possible functional level. Think about that for a minute. That could encompass a whole lot of things. Um, and I think that that's a place where um, you can Does do a lot of... therapy, mental health therapy? And it can, yes. All kinds of different therapies. Um, I know for kids with developmental disabilities, one of the controversies in Georgia has to do with um, ABA therapy. And uh, I know our Medicaid agency, I think, has taken the position that we do not, Georgia, does not cover ABA therapy as part of its Medicaid plan. Um, but I know that uh, in other places uh, it has been and can be covered. Um, state plan issues. Um, states must provide services so long as they could be covered under a state Medicaid plan going back to the mandatory piece. Um, they may not place preset limits or monetary caps on EPSDT services. Dollars should not drive services. The needs of the child should drive the services, okay? Um, question, does another state cover service under its Medicaid plan? So you might know of so, uh, uh, another state that has covered um, something that you know would be uh, beneficial to a child you're working with. That, I think, can be a good argument to say that, uh, you know, that service should be available here in Georgia. Question? I'm sorry, I do. The second bullet, state may not place preset limits, is, are you going to tell us something later about how to challenge that or sure. what to do? Okay. Sure. I mean, we'll talk, we can talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I had a question. Yeah, because that's actually the, it, um, one of the, the issues involved in our, the two cases we have going in federal court right now. Yeah. All right, so I'm a little confused. Okay. It's, there's federal mandate Medicaid services they have to provide, and then there are the state-based ones, or how does it work in, as it, far as? Going back to the basic concept that it's a partnership, okay? <laughs> Essentially, it's, it's a federal statute. It's federal law. The federal government provides actually most of the funding. Uh, it's in Georgia, it's like, well, now under the uh, Recovery Act, it's like 72% federal dollars, um, what would that be, 28% state dollars. Under normal circumstances, it's about 65%, 35% would be the split. So for every dollar that's spent, Medicaid dollar that's spent, the federal government is, is uh, paying 65 cents on that dollar. Georgia's paying 35. Um, but as it relates to, so you have the Medicaid Act itself, which is the, the primary infrastructure. Then you have the regulations that have been developed under that act, um, which provide further guidance as to what the states are allowed to do. Then you have the states themselves, you know, in those places where they have um, uh, discretion developing uh, policy. Um, and then there's uh, CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, developing policy as well, um, and agreements with states on various things. All right. There was a point where you said there were like mandatory services and yep. then there were optional services that the state could pick. And I was confused. As, is that only as to adults or that's adults and children? That is only as to adults. So for children, For children, all categories of services under the Medicaid Act are mandatory. So they can't actually pick and choose or say, we pro we'll cover this, but we won't cover this for a ch particular child. Well, they'll, they'll try to. Um, I mean, it, you know, the, the state will, does create a Medicaid plan to, um, you know, identify those services and things that they will cover and the way that they will cover them and the amount and the duration and scope. Um, but those sorts of preset limits or caps Either it's saying that you can only get this two times a week or you can only uh, have this for 30 days or, you know, something of that nature. Those caps 
will ye have to yield to uh, the child's right to services if the, if the treating physician is determined that they need more than that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. This is the big issue, medical necessity, because in the end it actually boils down to who gets to decide. Um, again, going back to what I was saying, treatments and services necessary to correct or ameliorate, all right? Because sometimes, you know, you think about it in the context of um, correcting. So you have a broken leg, they set the, the, the bone, they put it in a cast, the bone heals, you've corrected the problem. Um, for a lot of kids, and I know most of you probably know this, um, they have chronic conditions, chronic issues that are lifelong, and you don't correct them. That's, what you do is, it's, the, it's a concept of amelioration, um, it's a concept of, of trying to um, prevent the loss of function and the acquiring of, uh, you know, the optimal level of function. Actually, if you go back to that definition of the rehabilitative um, provision, it has that sort of concept embedded in there. So when Congress um, passed EPSDT, uh, there was some language around the role of the treating physician and the idea of deference to the treating physician in these decisions about medical necessity and the decisions about what, what's necessary to correct or ameliorate a child's condition. And so they said, you know, the physician's the key, key figure. And I think that that's probably the assumption most everybody makes in their own health care, the health care about their kids or anybody they know, is that you have that relationship with your treating physician, you work with them, they address your, your issues. Whether it's, should I go get a flu shot or, you know, uh, my child has an infection and, and needs, you know, some antibiotics or something. I mean, it's, you know, that's the normal course of, of, I think, affairs for most people. Um, okay. One of the things that happened in Georgia a couple years ago um, was we were able to get a, a piece of legislation passed. Um, it's at 49.4.169. And it, this is embedded in, a, in a, a provision of the code that deals with therapy services, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy. And within it, we're able to embed this definition. Medically necessary service is defined as prescribed by a physician or other practitioner to diagnose, correct, or ameliorate defects, physical or mental illnesses, and health conditions, whether or not such services are in the state plan. Guess where we got that language? Now, it got a little butchered, you know, because uh, we had to work with a variety of, of folks on this, but that's where that came from. In fact, in, the, in that provision, it actually defines EPSDT as meaning EPSDT, US, uh, 42 U.S.C. 1396-DR, okay? So it, it, it defines EPSDT, defines what medical and ne medically necessary services are, and it defines what correct or ameliorate is. And again, going sort of what I was referencing before, um, trying to maintain the child's health in the best possible condition, compensate for a health problem, prevent it from getting worse, prevent the development of additional problems, improve or maintain overall health, even if the treatment or service will not cure the recipient's overall health. Okay? So this is in the Georgia Code. This is a tool that I think is not being utilized yet, okay? But it's sitting there, it's waiting, all right? Um, okay, so advocating for treatment. Question of how do you, okay, I've told you what, you know, some general concepts about EPSDT. Now, how do we turn this into real practice? Um, first question, whatever the condition or illness was, was it diagnosed during an EPSDT screen? Okay. Um, the services or treatments that are prescribed, is it covered by 1396-DA, okay? Is that service necessary to correct or ameliorate, right? You get, these are the things you've got to sort of force the physician to think about a little bit in writing the prescription or writing the letter, letter of medical necessity. Because quite frankly, I would use those words. I would say, I am making this request. Here's, and it, the next slide is a little more detailed, but I believe this treatment or service is necessary to correct or ameliorate the child's condition. 
the, the condition I have just outlined for you in this, in this letter. Um, basically, y the service can't be experimental or cosmetic. Okay, that's actually one of the things that won't be covered. Um, and a consideration of that there's no less costly, costly, equally effective alternative available in the geographic area. Okay? So, you want a physician to conduct a comprehensive assessment. Um, they're going to write a prescription and they're going to complete all the DMA forms. Division of Medical Assistance is the division within the Department of Community Health. That's our Medicaid agency, okay? Um, there are all these forms. There's, it's, the DMA-6 is the most common one that's sort of used to access services. Um, if a prior authorization is required for a service, the physician's got to complete the, the necessary paperwork. If no prior authorization is required, you just simply take the prescription to the appropriate provider, and the provider can start billing, okay? So, this would be what you want in your physician's letter, okay? These are the elements of it. Um, this would just be a good outline to provide to them to sort of say, here's this child, here's the history, the diagnosis, prognosis, um, justification for why I'm ordering this, um, description of the service, and if you can, fit it into the Medicaid box. Fit it into that category of service. Um, the length of time it's needed, and uh, a statement that the request, like I said, is pursuant to EPSDT to correct or ameliorate the child's condition, okay? So there are appeal rights that, that go with this. Um, if you are denied uh, or in any way, and a denial can be um, not just a straight out denial, but if, if uh, the request has been reduced. So let's say the request was for uh, uh, physical therapy three times a week and all they approved was two times a week. At that point, you've been denied that one therapy session. You have a, a right to an appeal, okay? Um, the interesting thing is the Medicaid Act actually requires that the parent or guardian receive written notice, okay? What you're going to find is that never... That, I, I rarely see that happening. What they do in this state is, th since the providers are typically uh, submitting the request online, that's where the denial will come through. It'll just come through online. So the parents and guardians never see anything. And sometimes, if, you, if you've got a good relationship with your provider, obviously they'll tell you, okay? But where this becomes problematic is, when you have been denied or reduced, that is supposed to generate them putting you on notice that you now have appeal rights and how to appeal and where you send it and what you're supposed to do, okay? But if you don't know that, no one's told you, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty fundamental denial of due process. Um, so the letter that you get is supposed to include the exact treatment or service being denied, any additional information needed from the provider. This actually, what's, what's fascinating is this, these uh, bullets right here about what the letter is supposed to include came out of a, a case in Georgia back in the early 90s. It was class action on behalf of uh, Medicaid beneficiaries uh, because the state wasn't providing appropriate notices. Um, and so th this, is, this is binding Georgia precedent. Uh, it's actually a Superior Court case. Um, so if your claim is denied, you have the right to file an appeal. Denial letter must inform you how to do so. The state has 90 days to make a final determination of your appeal once you request uh, uh, an appeal. Um, and DCH, now this has become a particular problem. It was a bigger problem in the past. So I, I don't think it's as big a problem now. What effectively happens is you request an appeal. DCH, as the Medicaid agency, is then supposed to send that uh, request over to the Office of State Administrative Hearings, OSA. These are our administrative law judges in Georgia. Um, in the Katie Beckett context, <laughs> what they were doing is they, you'd appeal it, and then DCH was holding on to them. They wouldn't send them over to OSA, so people would, would have, it'd be like three years um, before anything would happen. Um, yeah. Okay, that's the end of the slideshow. Um, I think at this point, 
what might be helpful is take a break or should we take a break? Yeah, do we, do we have any other questions right now? Yeah. elaborate a little more about this appeal thing because mm -hmm. from what I'm hearing is that there's a right to appeal but most people never know that because they're not given that letter so my question is I mean what's the point how do they find out and if you I mean because generally there's a time frame in which you have to request you know so I mean if you don't know right so well, in the absolutely, absolutely, and and this, you know, if you uh, if you're a recent grad from law school, I mean, you'll you'll remember the case Goldberg versus Kelly. I mean, this is these are older concepts. I mean, the concept of due process obviously is a fundamental notion in our constitution, and um, I think that there, I know in certain circumstances there have been folks that have been very successful in. Uh, taking legal action against the Department of Community Health around their failure to provide not only notice, but timely hearings. Um, because you are entitled to a, a prompt resolution. It's that 90-day uh, resolution of the issue. Does the parent have a right to an attorney? And if so, who is that attorney? I wish. I wish. Um, there are, there's uh, different legal service type organizations. Obviously, there's Georgia Legal Services, there's Atlanta Legal Aid, uh, there's us, Georgia Advocacy Office. Um, we typically are the um, entities that get, that folks get referred to um, to discuss these kinds of cases. Um, but, you know, it, it's, there are limited resources, obviously, um, and but this is a, is a very, very troubling issue, and, um, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's ripe for uh, investigation and, and prosecution uh, as a legal matter. Thanks, Josh. Just a real quick question on the second to last denial appeal slide. You use... Um, you refer to a couple of contractors, GMCF and APS? Yes. Who are those? Who are they? Okay. When, um, <clears throat> so the, the Medicaid agency is contracted with a couple of vendors to essentially do their prior authorizations. So if a doctor is submitting a request for particular kinds of services, um, what they'll do is they'll submit into these vendors. GMCF is the George Medical Care Foundation. I forget what APS stands for. It's like American Psychiatric Services or something like that. Um, and what these vendors do is they have uh, medical professionals of one kind or another that actually look at these requests for services. And they make the decisions as to whether or not you get the service and how much, that sort of thing. And they do that consistent with the policies that the Department of Community Health has developed. To that, so they send these pre-auths. Are these are these folks typically um, sympathetic to DCH in giving friendly denials or recommending the least? How, how objective is are, are, are these agencies? They are a contractor of the Department of Community Health. Yeah. I, I <laughs> is there any way to expedite the decision process in case of? life-threatening illness or something like that. I recently read an op-ed by, you might have seen it, by an optometrist here in Georgia, and he was describing some kind of eye drops or something that were necessary for children, and if they didn't get them in a certain amount, window of time, the degenerative eye disease would progress. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to get a decision if it's denied very, very quickly in those circumstances, and how would you do that? Well, I think that the... Um yeah, I think the, the basic notion behind EPSDT and Medicaid is the prompt provision of services. I mean, it's the idea that we are going to screen kids and then get them the appropriate uh, treatment based on the screening, and we're going to do it promptly. Uh, there shouldn't be any waiting around. There, aren't, there shouldn't be waiting lists, um, you know, as you would see in... What's that? There's the 90 days. Well, that's only if you're denied okay. or if you're reduced. Uh, but otherwise, there should be prompt provision of services. 
Um, and, you know, I, I think that, yeah, because, I mean, we regularly run into situations where you have uh, something that's going to go really badly unless services are provided promptly. And, you know, then it's just advocacy and good relationships. I mean, you get to know these people over time and, you know, um, but it, it is knowing who to call. Um, you know, typically, uh, if you're arguing about the prior authorization, you'll be, you may be talking to the folks at GMCF or APS. If it's sort of gone beyond that, you may actually be talking to the program people within DCH that are over whatever particular service you're trying to access. Yeah. If, <laughs> I have a two-part question. One is, how long do you have from the point where you get the denial letter to actually appeal? And if you don't agree with OSA's decision, where do you go from there? Okay, so typically what they'll do is they'll issue what's called an initial denial letter. And the initial denial letter will give you an opportunity to, um, to you know, if, they, if they've said you haven't provided enough information or we need something else or something's missing, it gives you an opportunity to provide additional information. Provides your provider an opportunity to try and justify further why you think a certain thing is, is necessary. After that, they'll, they'll make their final determination. And then typically, um, the typical time to appeal is 30 days. Um, but, um, and I, I, I'm not quite sure this is true in all instances, but under certain circumstances, if you appeal within 10 days, so let's say you already have services, okay, and they're trying to reduce or deny or do something else to your services. So let's just take, um, you know, nursing hours. You've been getting, you know, eight hours of, of nursing services a day in your home, and they're going to reduce that. Um, you know, you can appeal uh, within a short period of time, within 10 days, to hold it in place. So while the pen, during the pendency of the appeal, your services at the current level stay in place. Um, but otherwise, it's a 30-day uh, appeal um, window. Well, can I ask my, okay. Is yep. it working? All right, well, we represent children who are um, dependent, well, adjudicated dependent here in the state of Georgia. We have a lot of children who are housed and being treated at like mental health facilities. How do we make referrals? Um, we have kids who have alleged being, they're being beaten up um, at these facilities, they're sure. being neglected. How do we get your agency involved, I guess, to do the investigation or whatever? Call. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we are, this is the thing. And this is actually one of the things I wanted to tie in and really, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, you know, if you congregate and segregate people, you're going to have abuse and neglect, okay? And I, people have told me this, and now that I've done this work for a while, I know it to be true. Um, if you do congregate and segregate, you will have abuse and neglect. Um, we see it all the time. We see it in all kinds of congregate settings. Um, so, you know, in my mind, we, 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 the real question for each of these kids is, what do kids need? right? We all know the answer to this question. We do. It's, it's mom and dad, home, safety, friends, school, play activities, enriched environments, fun stuff to do. Um, you know, this is not hard to figure out. It's hard to, to make happen, obviously. And, you know, I've got a six-year-old and, you know, struggle. But you, we all know what kids need. And, um, I think one of the things that we do in this state in particular, and it's probably true in a lot of places, is we marry up the idea of services in a place. Okay? If you need something, you've got to go somewhere to get it. And I think one of the, the things that we've we got to figure out how to break with is the concept of that services do equal a place. No. I mean, and this is, this is the, sort of one of the, I think, the things of, about EPSDT that to me is promising. It's the concept that what we're doing when we think about EPSDT and a child's right to it is we're sitting there looking at that child and that child's needs and looking at their individual circumstances, the individual conditions, and out of that, developing uh, a plan of care. Um, 
And if we take as the fundamental idea that kids need home, family, friends, then, and we, we hold that to be really true for the long-term well-being and, and, you know, proper development of kids, all kids, then how do we, how do we think about these services and systems we have going here and the child's right to them through PSDT to make that a possibility? That's got to be the under, underlying value in all this, I think. Um, yes? Who explains all of this to the user? This is a very complex issue. You know, I'm a lawyer, and I still don't understand. And I don't understand all of this. Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, mechanism within your organization which seeks to partner with community groups so that they can explain to the target populations in the communities, you know, what their rights are and, and what these procedures are. Sure. Well, we, I know we personally have developed with the uh, Georgia Council on Developmental Disabilities um, a group of um, handouts, flyers, that, I mean, they're, you know, they're double-sided. Um, and we've done them for different folks. We've done them for parents and we've done them for health care providers. Um, they have a little bit different sort of emphasis. But it's to capture a lot of these basic ideas and put them out there, educate people, um, and then also contact information to ask questions. I mean, I, I answer questions about this all the time. Um, you know, we probably should move on to Stephen's presentation, so we have plenty of time. Um, Josh, can I just build on that one thing? Because yes. the Barton Clinic has actually developed a Know Your Rights to Medicaid program, EPSDT, specifically designed for older youth in foster care and foster parents. So we have a PowerPoint presentation and we've got a flyer. So we're happy to work with whomever to get that to an appropriate audience. So we could come to Fulton and train you on it or you do a train the trainer. If you work with DFACs and their foster care no, we haven't. We've developed the program and we've delivered it directly to some foster parents groups. So we've been working with the Adoptive and Foster Parents Association of Georgia. We're, j we're I mean, very small. But if you have a group that you're interested in, you can contact me. Okay. Great. Take a break. Take a ten minute break? Five? Five. Five minute break. Yeah. <laughs> The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.